confidence that we are closer to peace than ever before. All right, so the first thing is, we have victories in Lugansk. I know, I know Russia says they have all of Lugansk. It's not true. Uh, there are two areas of Lugansk they still do not have. And on one level, it looks like that's a pure, like um, Ukraine's been very careful to avoid Pyrrhic victories. In other words, victories that cost so much as not to be worth it. Um, but by holding on to Lugansk territory, they can deny Putin and Shoigu and Gerasimov and the Russian military uh, hawks real victory on a propaganda level. And so they held off in, there's there's two sections. The one is uh, Bilarivka, and they have just this this chunk, but also then sat to the south at the Vukhalarisk uh, power station. Again, that also denies power. So, so that is awesome. Also, they blew up another warehouse of ammunition in Kadivka. So again and again and again, I'm going to say that uh, these things are possible because the people of Lugansk do not want the Russian occupation. Um, also, in Donetsk, there was an explosion of military warehouse at the Topaz plant in Donetsk. And then um, also a fire at the Kamaz Center. Now, Kamaz are those, those heavy-duty trucks that they drive uh, logistics into battle. So not only have they destroyed the stuff that is carried by the trucks, they've destroyed the ability to service the trucks. Awesome. Also, though, that 19, so that was three hours ago that the Topaz plant blew up. Well, three hours, bef uh, 19 hours ago, they blew up a uh, the munitions warehouse on the railroad there in Donetsk. So over and over and over again, we're seeing these bloodless resolutions, the breakdown of logistics, and it's reaching critical levels. Um, again, you know, imagine a tank, you have a gas tank and you have a leak in the gas tank. You can still drive, right? You've still got gas in your tank. Right up to the moment when gas is gone, that's when you discover, oh, I have no gas. That's what's happening with the Russian war machine. They're, they're throwing everything they can at the front and their reserves are dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. These stockpiles are being destroyed left, right, and center. It's incredible. And so to that end, um, <clears throat> many of you all remember, I've mentioned Girkin, uh, or also known as uh, Strokov. Uh, he's the military head of the Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, he is a military genius, but he is a diehard fascist. And uh, he oftentimes, throughout this whole thing, has been clearly and concisely calling out Russian failure in detail. And uh, because he's at war, we've talked about it, he's one of the most vocal of the war party that's saying Putin and Shoigu and Grasimov are not doing enough to win this war. And so he's laying down what it's going to take. And so listen, listen to what he said. He complained that Russian forces had failed to meet the announced goals of the second stage of the special operation. Again, over and over again, Shoigu's been celebrating early. Kadyrov's been celebrating early. He's like, hey, hey, listen, we have taken Lugansk. You haven't even taken all of Lugansk, let alone Lugansk and Donetsk, let alone the real goals, which is um, preparing the army, in his mind, to actually take all of Ukraine. And he said, he said, um, he... <clears throat> He noted that the Ukrainian defense of Lizachansk was deliberately designed to inflict maximum damage on Russian troops and burn through Russian manpower and equipment. That's what we've been saying. We've been saying that the whole point of the defense of Severna Donetsk and Lizachansk was to absorb massive amounts of Russian manpower and, and, and artillery and uh, every kind of weaponry so that it didn't go elsewhere, right? To burn through the reserves that Russia has. And he said they were successful. They're successful. And listen, he said, he said he strongly suggested that accepting battle on the Ukrainians' terms was a significant misstep of Russian leadership. Okay, again, Russians wanted to play. We win, but they win. And that they had a Pyrrhic victory in Lizachansk and in Severna Donetsk. He also stated that the Russian troops need time to rest and replenish in order to recover their offensive potential and noted that the lack of individual soldier replacements and unit rotations is severely degrading morale. 
What does that mean? That means that literally the, the troops are not being supported. They don't have the supplies they need. They're not being allowed to rest. They're not being allowed to regroup. They're not developing the units into co uh, cohesive uh, veteran units. They're just literally cobbling together whatever they can. And the soldiers recognize the lack of support and it makes them want to not fight for victory, but fight for survival. And that is a fundamental, very important problem in war. When your soldiers are fighting for survival, they don't take risk and they don't seize opportunities. They just fight for the bare minimum. And uh, he, he warned that take, but however, he said, if you allow them to rest, you're gonna allow the Ukrainians time to uh, reconstitute their offensive capability. In other words, find better defensive positions, resupply the front. So he's like, we're in a catch 22. Either way, we're done. And, and he basically said, um, he said this again and again, without um, uh, 100, 200, 300,000 troops um, being mobilized, which means declaring war, there, there's no way we can do, we can win here. And in fact, we're on the ropes. We're, we're close to losing totally. So this is coming from within the Russian apparatus. That's what's happening. Come on, so continue to pray. These logistics victories are huge. But also pray because in Russia, there has come out a report that United Russia, that's Putin's party, is pushing their candidates to talk about the war. To, so one of the things that's happened in the last 24, 48 hours, every so often they, the, the Kremlin puts forth a couple of talking heads to see if declaring war would be met with popular response. And each time it hasn't, so they backed off. And once again, there's been this declaration, what Ukraine's doing is war against Russia. Like, and so can we, and so they're pushing their, their local politicians to try to push a war narrative. So pray, that can't go there. This will mean absolute devastation for Russia, let alone Ukraine, if they do a mobilization. Pray, pray, pray against that. Pray that these forces that we have arrayed against Putin, right? The, the peace party that says, no, 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 we got to get our stuff back, peace at any cost. And the war party that says, we have to win everything, which is unsustainable, will, cr will create the pressure that allows the Daniels to rise up in the midst, in the middle, and bring righteousness, truth, and justice. So pray against that. That's really important. Another sign that, that again, things are not going well for Russia over and over again, the idea that Russia is able to wait uh, the West out by li literally living off of oil revenues. Well, oil sales to the the Far East, so that's India and China, right? And, and other countries, which has been the key for making up the difference as they've quit selling to um, Europe. Those sales have dropped by 15% in June over May. Wow. So, so some, some things are going on, whether um, clients are refusing to take delivery or it's too difficult because uh, they're having to do these transfers at sea. No telling what's going on, but that's a huge break. So pray, continue to pray for that, those mechanisms of supply to the Russian war machine to break down. Um, also grain, we're continuing to pray for that whole situation in Turkey um, with, um, and uh, uh, Zelensky has been working closely with Turkey uh, and the Ukraine envoys have, but also they've been working closely with the UN to and holding the line that this is a problem by Russia, this is thievery by Russia, and the only way to resolve this is to open up Ukrainian ports without, so one of the things they've said is Russia and security guarantees. In other words, let's sail some Russian warships up into Odessa to protect Odessa. See a problem with that? So that's the narrative that's being held. Pray that narrative holds that Russia doesn't get to secure, that they can get the grain out of Odessa, but also that Russia's st what Russia has stolen will not be allowed to be sold on the open market to benefit Russia. So pray for those things. Those are, those are things happening. And finally, Japan has outed the fact that um, Putin's been trying to get uh, China's President Xi Jinping to come visit Moscow. Well, he's not so interested. Uh, one, uh, you know, personal safety, but also he's been careful to not directly align with the Kremlin. He, he's still 
still trying to play both. And when that came out, oh my goodness, the Kremlin got so fr mad. Uh, Peskov, the so spokesman for Putin, said, no, no, that's not true, not true. It's, it's COVID the restrictions. No, it's not. No, it's not. And uh, But again, these kind of narratives force China to begin to speak where they don't want to speak. So pray they continue the a wedge keeps being driven between China and Russia. Uh, on the support front, uh, parent, Boris Johnson just uh, uh, speaking with uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine today uh, announced another $100 million of support. That's huge. NATO, it has, um, they have gone to the next level. They've signed off on the accession protocols for Finland and Sweden. We knew they would. But now the next step is for it to go to the parliaments of those countries where it seems like a no-brainer, no a done deal. And the result will be that they are brought into NATO, increasing the pressure on Russia. Yesterday I mentioned, I, I said wrongly, that Norway was not part of NATO. That was a mistake. And thanks for uh, one of y'all calling me on that. Uh, we want the everything. We like truth. We don't, we, you, we don't need falsehood of any kind. That's why we always say the truth revealed is going to always be a weapon in the hand of love. And so um, another thing too, Japan has increased sanctions uh, and they have agreed to the sanction on gold. That's very important uh, from an industrial standpoint as gold is the second largest export for Russia with over, I think, $15.8 billion in exports annually. So that's awesome. And they've included a number of other uh, care, uh, people on that sanctions list. And finally, Lend-Lease. You guys are familiar. The Lend-Lease uh, that was passed, I believe, on May 10th in uh, ACT in the United States. This is a key thing for financially, or not just rebuilding, but also supplying, strengthening, and uh, on a, um, a economic and military level from the US to Ukraine. And pray for that. That's coming underway. It takes months to get on plan, on, on, uh, um, you know, online, and one of them has to do with the financial year begins in October, and that's probably when most of this is gonna roll out, but it's gonna make a huge difference because especially as Ukraine heads into winter, they need, they need gas, they need support, they need all kinds of support, and it looks like that's gonna be happening. Continue to pray for the development of that Lend-Lease um, Act um, in the real world um, in the coming months. So what are we praying for? Man, there's a lot of good stuff, right? So what are we praying for? Well, um, in the last uh, hours, um, if I can open this up, um, it, in the, since this morning, Russia has fired 60 projectile missiles at the Sumi region. Again, just suffering, just suffering, hitting homes, hitting, not hitting military targets. Some of it has to do with that Russians are not trained well enough to aim properly. Some of it has to do with how messed up their weapons are, but some of it just has to do with terror. Pray for the protection of the innocent in Sumi, in, in Her, uh, um, Kharkov, and in in Mikolaeva, as they fired another six missiles at um, at, um, at at Mikolaeva, but totally forgot in Dnipro, the city of our friends Vladimir and Lily and the Church Plagaviest, six missiles were fired at the city, and they were all intercepted. One got through, but it didn't get through to the city proper. So praise God. Continue to pray for those kind of interceptions, for missiles not working. Uh, again, bloodless resolution. Um, also, pray for Bakhmut, um, the village of Klinovli. We've, we've seen multiple successes over time. Again, I, I can't say it enough. If Russia, if Ukraine is retreating with no loss and they're holding it to the very last, um, making Russia waste power on um, the middle of nowhere. That's an awesome thing. But they have, they, so Russia has taken the village of Klinove, which is eight kilometers to the east of Bakhmut. Bakhmut is that, uh, another one of those key cities. So as Russia's moving, they're really going for Slavyansk. Um, they've had little tiny bits of success to the northwest of Slavyansk. But then as they're coming towards uh, Bakhmut from Klinove, pray for Bakhmut, pray for Slavyansk. Pray for the Ukrainians to set up really good um, uh, um, uh, defensive positions where they're able to sit and wait things out uh, and not uh, and not be in danger, but actually threaten the Russian forces. Um, also, uh, continue just to pray. Um, pray for Mariupol. Right now, there's over a hundred thousand people still in Mariupol. Amazingly, and yet. 
Uh, I think it was 430,000 before the war, 100,000, but only 3% of those have water, 3%. And so right now, the people of Mariupol are doing anything they can to find water. Now, you got to understand, it's hot. In heat, bacteria begins to grow, and water becomes unbelievably dangerous. The things that are living in it, the, uh, they don't have adequate sanitation, so it's not good. So they're facing a massive cholera um, um, outbreak. Pray for the people of of Mariupol, but also pray that this gets to the world, that the worlds can see that Russian occupation is never humanitarian. It is always about domination control as they're spending all their money on attempting to, to, um, to, uh, uh, brainwash the kids. Uh, that's really where all the money's going is for russification, for, for brainwashing the kids um, of these hundred thousand, um, you know, and so pray, 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 pray. Um, Man, there's there's a lot going on, um, but again, as I said, pray for Bakhmut and Slavyansk. Uh, pray for the weapons to reach the front. Pray for the continued ability to identify and hit a weapon stockpiles, and pray for the Russian people to see to not back a mobilization at all. Another big thing too is pray for the younger generation. Anybody south of thirty really doesn't generally believe in the war. Anybody north of 30 is a lot of times believing the propaganda. And so the, to combat that, um, Putin is pushing forward a new youth movement. Think of like the young pioneers again for the, or, or the brown shirts of, uh, of um, Hitler's time. Pray or Hitler youth. Pray for the, the young people to continue to have a clear head, clear mind, and fundamentally refuse the war. So, all right. So good things to pray for. Thank you guys for continuing to share, to getting the word out. Please consider making these shares public um, as we are exclusively on this page now. Your sh sharing makes a difference. But also thank you for giving. Um, I was just checking our funds. It looks like some more funds are coming in. So in the next day or two, we're going to be able to send those directly out. Please consider giving arisealife.org slash help Ukraine. Again, we're grateful for all of you who've given, uh, but we're believing for more and more and more as God continues to multiply those resources as Vladimir and Lilia are continuing to risk their lives and the lives of their team are continuing to risk to bring life, to bring hope, to bring peace everywhere they go. We love you guys. Have an amazing day. Take care.